Please rise as we read our scripture, which is Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The light, the night will shine like day, for the darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked away from me, you who were bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. Amen. Please have a seat. You may think you really know somebody, especially somebody who's closest to you in this life. Well, there was a British lady named Audrey, uh, Audrey Phillips who thought she knew her husband pretty well. Her husband's name was Glenn, and Audrey and Glenn had been married for 64 years before Glenn died. 64 years, by all accounts, Glenn was a wonderful family man, a civil engineer, well-liked, but after Glenn died in 2015, Audrey was going through his paperwork and all his, all his things, and she made a rather startling discovery. She discovered that Glenn was a spy. He had been uh, approached by the British Intelligence Service back in World War II, since he had a photographic memory, and they said, would you come and spy on German prisoners for us? So that sounds pretty good. And he started to do that. He would go to the prisons and he would spy on, on German prisoners and over, overhear their conversations and bring that information back. And then for the rest of their marriage, he continued to have that secret double life where he performed services for MI6, MI5, sorry. And she only found out about this after they died. 64 years. She never knew his deepest secret. You may think you know somebody if you're married that long. That's not the case. You don't always know everything about those even really close to you. So I have to ask you this question. Who can truly know you? Who can really know everything about you? Maybe you have a friend or family member you might know better than anybody else. You can anticipate their every line. You finish each other's sentences. You know, that sort of thing. Every once in a while, my wife and I have one of those psychic moments where she starts to talk, and I go, oh, I know what you're going to say already. She's like, how do you know? I'm like, you know, because I know you, right? And she, she does the same for me. Maybe you've had a moment where you 
bear your soul to somebody. You tell them secrets you've never told another living human being. And that's a person you place your confidence in. But even then, there are gaps. That person doesn't know everything about you. They may know a lot about you, but not everything. There's a limit to what any one of us can truly know about somebody else. So somebody can only truly know you then if they personally made you, if they have complete knowledge of all your thoughts and all your actions, and they happen to be everywhere you go in life. I think that's the only way somebody can truly completely know you. They have to know your thoughts, they have to be everywhere you are, and they have to have, you know, have made you. That's what King David is boasting of here in Psalm 139, that our God knows us inside and out. He knows us inside and out. Now in church we often confess that God has a lot of attributes, but we have three attributes we tend to lump together. We call them the three omnis, or the three alls. God is all-powerful, all-present, and all-knowing. The fancy seminary words there are omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. All-powerful, all-present, all-knowing. And here in Psalm 139, David, in just such beautiful language, expounds on each of these three key attributes of God, of who God is, all with the purpose, David says, of knowing me inside and out, that my God truly knows me in a way nobody else does. And because he does, it transforms my life. But then again, we think about this. When we real, I don't know if you've really thought about how much God knows about you, but when you start going down that trail, it gets uncomfortable quick. He, re- he really knows that? He saw me doing that thing at the stoplight the other day. I, you know, okay, I didn't know something. He, he knows everything. We kind of laugh every Christmas time, right, when we start singing that song about Santa he knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. And we go, ha ha, that jolly stalker. He's always, you know, he's always watching me. That's kind of unnerving. We've talked about this at home. I tell my kids, God is always watching you. And their first instinct is, I don't like that. You know, they tell me, they don't like that. I don't want him to watch me all the time. I don't want him to see me when I'm doing the bad stuff. Just want him to see me while I'm doing the good thing. But that's how it really is with God. We may not like it, but He's always present. He knows all, and He's all powerful. So if there is an all knowing, all powerful, all present God, and if that's uncomfortable to you, then I have a solution for you. If that's really uncomfortable, if you don't like that idea, the solution is you can limit God or pretend to. You can try to put box them in to make them more comfortable. I've seen people do this time and again. That when they really confront the omniscience, omnipotence, uh, omnipresence of God, they go, that's, that's just too much. So I'm going to limit him. I'm going to take him down a few pegs so that he's at a more comfortable level. So for these people, they propose that God is like this. That he, he knows a lot. He's pretty powerful. But he respects your privacy like a good neighbor. You're here, he's over there in his own house. And you guys can have warm conversations over a fence. That's how some people like to see God. He won't really get too involved in your life. He won't really try to change you unless you you send him a formalized document in triplicate, notarized. You have to give God permission to come over and visit your house. That makes some people very comfortable. Now that's acceptable, but it's a lie. It's a comfortable lie, but it's a lie nevertheless. That type of thinking doesn't require us really to deal with our sin, to face the fact that God can see it all the time. That God calls us in the Bible to die to our sin, to take up the cross and follow Him, take on this identity of Jesus Christ, and welcome in the Holy Spirit to transform us from the inside out. That's, what, that's uncomfortable. God, Christ coming into my life and the Holy Spirit transforming me is not a comfortable process. But some people, it's, it's too much, and so they try to limit God. 
But for those of us who love God, who trust Him, as David does right here in Psalm 139, His all-powerful, all-present, all-knowing nature is actually a deep comfort. It's a great thing. It's something that helps David sleep restful at night. How do you sleep at night? I sleep because I have an all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful God. You don't, but I do. And that's how I sleep at night. So he's not complaining. He lists all these things about God. But he's not complaining about any of it. He's praising God. So I want us to take a look at, at these three key attributes of God really quickly and see how not only are they comforting, but how they can transform our lives. So the first attribute of God that David declares is probably the one that I have seen disturbed in most people, that God knows everything about you. God knows everything. He knows all of your thoughts. He knows everything you've done. He knows everything you're going to do. Everything. There's absolutely nothing he doesn't know. David puts it this way. He says, you've searched me, Lord, you know my Google search history. You have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. I mean, is there, is there a better picture of the totality of God's knowledge of us than in the way David puts it here in Psalm 139? He could just say, yeah, God, you know everything about me. But the way he puts it really makes us think about it. It's not a picture of a God who's limited in any way, is it? This is a God who has intimate knowledge of every one of his children. He knows you better than any other person on this planet. Not just what we do and we say on the outside. Not just what everybody else sees of us. He knows those dark thoughts you have. He knows those sins that are on the inside. He knows those weird dreams he had last night. We were talking before the service about bizarre dreams we have. He knows those. He knows everything about you. There's a romance comedy several years ago called What Women Want. My wife loves this movie. Mel Gibson, romance comedy, drags me in and says, you've got to watch this. Okay, I'll watch it. And the, the premise of the movie is this guy gets zapped by electricity at one point and then he starts hearing the thoughts of women around him. And this guy's a womanizer, so he at first thinks this is like a gift from heaven, right? I can manipulate all these women because I know what they want, I know their thoughts. And that's what he does at first. He kind of starts to manipulate them. He uses that knowledge in a very dark way. But then he has kind of this change of heart. It starts to change him. He sees himself reflected in their eyes. And by the end of the film, he's using that knowledge to understand them and to help them. And that's what God does with this knowledge of us. I don't know about you, but I would not be able to handle the power of knowing other people's thoughts. I wouldn't want that. I'm, I'm flawed, I'm sinful, I could not handle that. I have enough in this own head as myself. I don't need more than one person in here. And that's what David says. If you look at verse 6 right here, you still have your Bibles open. He says this, he says, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I can't handle it, God, but I'm okay that you have that knowledge. I can't handle it, it's too wonderful for me, not too wonderful for you. You can have that knowledge because I can be safe with you having that knowledge. I can trust you having that. I know that you're not going to turn around and manipulate me. You're not going to take that knowledge of me and run a scam on me. You're going to only use that to help me, to, to protect me, to build me up, to lead me in right ways. He says, that's, that's wonderful. If God's going to trust my life, it's, I'm, I'm sorry, if I'm going to trust God with my life, I need to know that He is trustworthy. And that he can take that knowledge and he can use that to guide me in the best possible way. Now in verse 5, David uses some interesting language here. He says all that knowledge God has is hemming him in. He says he's God is before him and behind him. He's hemming him in. This language is used in a couple ways. In the Hebrew, one way that's used is of a siege, of armies surrounding a city and besieging it. I guess that's one way you could look at God knowing everything in your life. That God, you know, you're in the middle and God's all around you and your life is under siege. 
But that's not the way David's using it. He's using it the other way. He says, God, you've hemmed me in like a hug. I don't know if you've ever really thought of hugs. Some of us aren't huggers. That's okay. I don't force hugs on anybody. Right now, nobody's hugging anybody anyways. But have you ever really thought about why we like hugs? When you're hugged, the other person is physically putting their arms around you. They're hemming you in. And through that physical action, they are showing you, you are loved and you are accepted. I love you. I accept you. I'm hemming you in with that love. It's all around you. Right? There's a deep comfort when we're hugged. Now, unless you're a bad hugger, in which case it's very uncomfortable. Thank you. But that's what God's doing here to David. David's saying, God, you hem me in. You take all that knowledge about me and you wrap me up in your love. I can trust you in that. No matter what happens in life, I know you're before me, you're behind me. You got it. You got all wrapped around me. You know what's something else we can do? when we come to, to knowledge that God knows everything about us, we can start having real conversations with God. We don't have to put on a front with Him. We don't have to pretend that we're something we're not. We don't have to try to scoot our sins over into the corner. We don't have to wear a mask. No pun intended. We don't. With God, we can just be real because He already knows everything about you. I want you to think about this just for a second. God knows you. He has searched you. He knows you. He knows everything about you. And He still wants to have a personal relationship with you. You ever think, ever have that thought, if that person over there, if they really knew who I was on the inside, if they really knew what I did, they really wouldn't, want to, wouldn't love me. They wouldn't want to be my friend. That's not how it is with God because God already knows everything about you. He knows every single thing about you. And then he turns around and says, but I want to be your Lord and I want to be your God and I want to be your Father. I want to be your Savior and I want to be your friend and I want to be your confidant and I want to be your helper. I want to be all those things to you. I want to have a relationship with you. And that's why David rocks back on his heels and he goes, really? Me? Why? Okay, I'm not going to ask why, God. I'm just happy. Happy that you want to be my God, you want to be with me, even though you know everything about me. Now, it's common that at some point, maybe when you're much younger, maybe last weekend, you decide to run away from home. Anybody, hand, I want to see some hands. Who has run away from home at some point in their life? The rest of you are liars. No, I'm just... No, I just a bunch of us have probably run away or you know somebody might have just gone I, I hate you mom, I hate you dad and they stomp out the front door of the house and they get maybe two blocks when they realize where are they going they don't have anywhere to live nobody's hiring eight year old kids in this, this political market so they go back home but there's that, that urge sometimes to just run away from your problems run away from the things that are frustrating go and hide you know Likewise, many people have tried and, and failed to run away from God. Maybe you have. The question that David brings up here is, where do you go to get away from an all-present God? Where do you go? Hasn't stopped some people from trying. Adam and Eve. Remember when they sinned? What's the first thing they did when they sinned? They hid from God. Not because they were getting playful and thought, God, you know, God's really good at this hide and go see. They hid from God because sin cannot be in a holy presence. They were terrified of God. They knew what they did was wrong. And they tried to flee from God. And I know you know where, I, where I'm going next, right? Jonah. Jonah gets a job from God. Bring my message to the people of Nineveh so that they may repent. And Jonah goes, that, that, yeah, that's a good God. Um, I'm just going to get on this boat going the opposite way as fast as I possibly can because then maybe I can get away from you. Ask Jonah how that worked out well for him as he spent three days in the belly of a big fish. If the consequences for fleeing God's presence, for trying to get away from God, trying to get away from your responsibilities in God weren't so serious, they would almost be silly. 
few years ago, there was a New York City bus driver. It's a true story. Got to the end of his shift, let out his last passenger, and just had this thought. What if I keep driving? And he did. He drove from New York City down to Miami. Just kept on going. And spent the next week of his life on a beach before the authorities finally caught up with him and found their missing bus. I don't know if he thought maybe nobody was ever going to find him. If he fled far enough, he'd just live on that beach forever. But sooner or later, the long arm of the law usually catches up with the bus stealers. And God, you can't run away from him. You can't. David declares here, he says, God is everywhere we are, everywhere, all present. And I'll tell you, if you're an unrepentant sinner, that is downright terrifying. That God is everywhere you are. That there is no sin you can sweep under the rug. Nothing you can do. You might be able to fool the rest of the world. You can't fool God who's everywhere you are. And he's writing it down. And you're going to be held to account for your sins. That's terrifying. But for the believer, it's actually a source of great comfort. Not only are our sins forgiven, so God takes that list he's been making and he puts it on his son on the cross. But the fact that God is everywhere you are means you will never be truly alone ever again in your life. That there is nowhere you can go where you say, everybody's left me. I have nobody to depend on. Nobody's there for me. David's rejoicing because he says, you know what, this is a guy, this is a king who had, had a nation against him, had his, his own son perform a palace coup. He was fleeing into caves. He lived in caves in fear of his life. He thought everybody was against him. He said, no matter who's against me, my God is always still there. He's always for me. I'm never alone. And that was just such great comfort. That's why he, he shares this with you and I want us always to look at the beautiful language of the Psalms. I know I'm kind of picking them apart. And I'm trying to teach you the, the doctrine that's in the Psalms. But never lose sight that the Psalms are beautiful. And listen to how David writes this. He could again, he could have just said, God, you're everywhere I am. But he doesn't. He says this, If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Isn't that beautiful? The, the, from the sun rising to the sun setting, God is with you. Remember last week we talked about how God grasps the hand of the pilgrim to help get them over that hill? That can only happen if God is always present in your life. So there's always a hand reaching down for you to grab on. You're never alone in Christ. And finally, I find it very interesting here that when God, or when David speaks of God's third attribute, his all-powerful nature, that David doesn't do what we expect him to do. You read a, a lot of the other Psalms, and when David speaks of God's power, the logical thing would be to talk of the creation of the universe. What's bigger than that? That's God's masterpiece, right? He created the universe. He created galaxies and stars and planets and earth and, and all these things. Instead, when David wants to display in Psalm 139 the power of an almighty God, he looks at the smallest thing he can imagine, which is the creation of a human life. Of an egg and a sperm meeting. And of life being born. And he says this, he says, he marvels. He says, Lord, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. In my mother's womb, you knit me together. He says, my physical body, bit by bit, you knit me together. And more than that, David goes on, he says, not only did you make my body, but you made my spirit, my soul. That's what the inmost being there is. When he says, you created my inmost being. So God, you made my body, but you made my soul too. And you put the two together. And David says, and if that's not all, not only did you make my person and my spirit, but you ordained every single day of my life before I was a twinkle in the eyes of my mom and dad. You already knew and ordained every day of my life. 
There is no surprise, no day of my life that you missed. And that's why when David gets to verse 14, and he says, I know that full well. That is David expressing an epiphany, where he's a revelation, where he's just, again, knocked back on his heels going, you made me. With that power, that creative power that created the universe, you channeled that power down and you made me. And you made me fearfully and you made me wonderfully. Let me tell you, you are not a mistake. You are not an accident that happened because chance happened to slam a bunch of molecules together and suddenly you find yourself here on this planet. I don't care if you feel that way, but you were deliberately crafted by the most creative being alive. You decided, I want to make somebody wonderful, I want to make somebody special, and I'm going to make you. And that's what God did. And he made your body, and he made your spirit, and then he gave you a purpose in him. That's what these, these days, that's why David is rejoicing over God ordaining his days, because he says, my days aren't an accident either. They're not a bunch of you know, like blank slates. Who knows what will happen? Anything possible. Maybe there will be a wasted life. He says, no, God, you've ordained every day of my life. Therefore, every day of my life has a purpose. And David's rejoicing that his life isn't going to be wasted. His life isn't meaningless. It's meaningful. It is purposeful. And he knows it fully well. He's just, he's so excited over this. When we ponder the words of Psalm 139, we are invited to share David's wonder here at the magnificence of God's knowledge, of his power, and his presence. We can spend the rest of our lives trying to wrap our heads around one of those things and never come to the end of it. That's why we need an eternity. But even though we can't grasp it, we can praise it. We can praise God's omnipotence, God's omniscience, and God's omnipresence. Because for us, it's of great comfort, it's of meaning, it's of purpose, it's of safety. This is our God. I don't settle for anything less. David didn't either. Neither should you. Let's praise him today. Let's pray. Dear Lord, once again, we come to the end of looking at one of your Psalms, and we realize there's no prayer that we can add on to the end of it that would be better than the words that were already here. So Lord, we praise you because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We invite you to search our lives, to know us, to help us know ourselves, help us get rid of the sin that lingers, to make us in your image. Lord, be with us today. Be with those who are still struggling with this relationship with you who are still on the outside of it. Maybe just don't, can't accept that you love them. Maybe they're thinking, Lord, Lord, I messed up too many times. I admit there's a God and maybe there's a God who made everything, but I can't admit that he loves me. Lord, I think there's a lot of people out there that think exactly that. I pray that the gospel would just, the message would go out to them, would reach them, touch their hearts, that you would quicken them, regenerate their hearts, make them open in faith, bring them to you. And for those of us who are in the faith, that you would just excite us with these words in Psalm 139, that we'd want to go out and tell people about a God who knows everything, is always there, and is all-powerful. Lord, in all these things, we praise your name. Amen. Now receive the benediction from the book of Revelation. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen? Come, Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. Go in peace.